Gettysburg. Gettysburg, what an unbelievable battle that was. The Battle of Gettysburg, what an unbelievable — I mean, it was so much and so interesting and so vicious and horrible and so beautiful in so many different ways. It, it represented such a big portion of the success of this country. Gettysburg, wow. I go to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, to look and to watch. And uh, the statement of Robert E. Lee, who's no longer in favor — did you ever notice that? No longer in favor. Never fight uphill, me boys. Never fight uphill. They were fighting uphill. He said, wow, that was a big mistake. He lost his great general, and uh, they were fighting. Never fight uphill, me boys. But it was too late. Um, that was former President Trump on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania on Saturday. I'm thinking, John Meacham, is there anything to say about what he said or maybe we should just move on? I don't think mm -hmm. Shelby, I don't think Shelby Foote put it exactly that way. Uh, I think yeah. that's a fair way to, to put it. <sighs> you know, Trump delivered that history lesson just outside Allentown, where at times he sort of stumbled along with his speech. Just this week, it was reported that an illegal alien, and you just look at this, what's happening. So in just hours, jury selection is set to begin in Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial in New York City. It is the first time in U.S. history that a former president will be on trial for criminal charges. Two sources with direct knowledge of the situation tell NBC News that 6,000 potential jurors will be subpoenaed to Manhattan criminal courts this week. Usually about 4,000 jurors are called in a week. More than 1,500 will be called today. Not all of these potential jurors are intended for the Trump trial, though. But the increase in number can be attributed to the former president's trial. At a manufactured event at Mar-a-Lago with Speaker Mike Johnson, Trump said he intends to testify at the trial, though Trump's attorneys have yet to confirm or deny whether he'll do so. That's the Speaker of the House with President Trump at Mar-a-Lago. And there's Stormy Daniels. Trump is accused of coordinating a hush money payment to that adult film actress Stormy Daniel during the 2016 election to keep quiet about an alleged sexual encounter. Trump was charged with falsifying documents to cover up that payment. He denies the charges and denies having had sex with Daniels. Joining us now, former deputy chief of the criminal division for the Southern District of New York, Christy Greenberg. She is an MSNBC legal analyst. Thanks for coming on this morning. I think let's start at the very beginning. A lot of people are going to really be focusing now that the trial is actually beginning. Can you explain what this is really about um, and then how jury selection could really impact the process here and even the outcome? Sure. So just to level set on a few things, making a hush yeah. money payment on its own, not illegal. Uh, falsifying business records, that is a misdemeanor under New York state law. So the way we get to a felony here is that these falsification of business records, the checks that he signed, the general ledger entries, those falsifications happened in order to commit another crime. And here, that was in order to conceal an agreement among Trump and others to unlawfully influence the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. So what I am going to be looking for in this trial is not necessarily the falsification of business records. I think the documents are very good. The de deception just kind of leaps from the page of some of these documents. They're using fake names, fake settlement agreements, fake invoices. You're really going to be looking for witness testimony to get you to that criminal intent, that these payments were there to influence the outcome of the election. So that is going to be a focus as we go through this trial. In jury selection, what are you looking for? you're looking for the person who could potentially hang this jury. In Manhattan, I think it is unlikely you're going to get an acquittal, but you could get one or two people who don't agree and hang this jury. So you are going to be looking for people that exhibit any kind of political bias in favor of Donald Trump. Have not have they voted for him? That's not a question, not what their political party affiliation is, but have they attended a rally? Have they you know, do they follow him on social media? What is their media diet? Um, 
you know, various questions about whether or not they think that he has been treated unfairly in this case, that it is unfair to, you know, charge, criminally charge uh, a former president of the United States. So mm -hmm. that's going to be first and foremost what both sides are going to be looking for, uh, as well as people who have a distrust of the law enforcement and the justice system, uh, people who are very opinionated, uh, lawyers who want lawyers off the jury. So those are the kinds of people that they're, both sides will be looking for. Prosecutors will want to keep those people off the jury, and the defense will want them on in the hopes of a mistrial. All right, let's bring in former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin from outside the courthouse in New York City. Uh, Lisa, finally, you've been leading up to this and giving us context, but today is the day that it begins. What will you be looking for? Mika, a lot of what I'm going to be looking for is what happens before the first prospective juror even walks into the courtroom. We understand that because over the weekend, Trump was on his Truth Social account making numerous posts about prospective witnesses, there could be this morning some discussion about those posts and what the consequences could be for any violation of the gag order. We also expect, based on correspondence that Trump's lawyers sent late last week, that they could say, to Judge Juan Marchand, hey, we know that you finalized your jury instructions and your protocol for selecting the jury, but we still don't think it's fair because you're going to allow anybody who says they're unable to serve to walk away scot-free, and that's not good enough for us for appellate purposes. We need to be able to distinguish between the person who says, I'm unable to serve because I've got a three-month-old at home, and the person who says, I'm unable to serve because I couldn't possibly be fair and impartial here. So look for those morning proceedings to take up a good and healthy amount of time this morning. And of course, where the gag order is at issue, you know that the former president is very impassioned about that. So I'm also looking to see, can he control his temper even in this first day of trial? Lisa, talk about the jury selection a little bit more, because it's really hard to believe that there are uh, 12 and 6 alternates out there who actually don't have an opinion about Donald Trump already or have an opinion about this case already. So how are they going to try and wit what are the kinds of questions they're going to be asking them to try and get to people who really could be fair jurors in this point in this trial? And also, what happens to that person who wants to sit on the jury in order to try and swing it one way or another and may lie about their own background? How do they weed them out? Well, let's start with your second question first. How do you suss out the people who are lying? Sometimes people can't help themselves, and they will answer questions even against their own self-interest of getting themselves on a jury. I am reminded of the second E. Jean Carroll trial where there was a prospective juror who exactly met that description. Person very much wanted to serve on the jury, but had to answer truthfully a series of questions that revealed that on balance, that person couldn't be fair and impartial. There were just too many different factors that showed not only a feeling one way or the other, but Kathy, an intensity of feeling. And that's really what this selection process is designed to ferret out. It's not, can you find 12 people and six alternates who are not biased in some way or another walking in the door. Everybody in America has a feeling about Donald Trump. I think you would be, as you noted, hard pressed to find someone who's neutral. The question is, can people set those feelings aside and be fair and impartial when they join with 11 others on a jury? The questions on balance are designed to help the lawyers and the judge ferret that out so that there are very few questions on this jury questionnaire in and of themselves that would be disqualifying. One that I can think of is the question about, do you belong, for example, to the three percenters or to the Boogaloo Boys? That may show a disinclination toward, first of all, the government, but also a feeling about former President Trump and the 2020 election, et cetera, that may make it hard for a person to serve. But very few others of them by themselves would disqualify someone. What you're looking for is someone who answers a battery of questions in a way that you can say, given this person's answers to questions X, Y, and Z, they cannot be impartial as a member of the jury. But first, we want to discuss the developments over the weekend after Iran launched more than 300 missiles and drones toward Israel, marking the first time Iran has directly attacked the Jewish state. So joining us now, spokesman for the Israeli government, Avi Hyman. And uh, sir, Iran calls its attack on your country legitimate and responsible action, um, that they were responding. My question to you, sir, is 
What are the options in terms of a response? And can you confirm that there will be a response to this? Thank you so much for having me on this morning. Um, let me first say that this uh, narrative of retaliation is, is actually absurd because um, I can't speak directly to that uh, strike uh, in Damascus. What I can say definitively, definitively, is that was not an embassy. It was not a consulate. It was not a diplomatic mission. It was uh, it was a military uh, target, part of the Al Quds force, uh, which is obviously Iran's uh, major exporter of terror around the world. So they were there to do Israel harm. Um, as far as uh, the response, Israel will uh, retain our right as a sovereign uh, democratic country to defend ourselves after what you said was an unprecedented attack. And uh, thank goodness a unprecedented response. Uh, had some of those uh, ballistic missiles, um, uh, suicide drones or cruise missiles, uh, had more of them landed, there could have been absolute c uh, catastrophe in Israel. It could have been total carnage. So we're, we're thankful and we're thankful to our strategic allies for standing with us on this one. Um, but it could have ended very, very differently. We have the President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, with us, and he has the next question for you, sir. Richard? Sir, you just referred to the fact that had some of those missiles or, the, uh, or drones Iran launched gotten through, it could have caused real damage. There's a school of thought, though, here in the United States and elsewhere that Iran seemed very anxious for this not to escalate. They were very quick to announce in New York that the whole given you know, back and forth had been concluded. Do you take that seriously? Do you think Iran intended for those missiles to get through? Or do you think that they were simply res doing what they did in order to say, essentially, Israel can't expect uh, to be a sanctuary? How seriously did you, did you understand their military attack to be? Well, I think this was a very, very serious uh, military attack. I, I'm not sure if there's a, a precedent for it. What I can say is that uh, this is a, a huge country attacking a tiny country, uh, a country uh, Iran has been uh, funding uh, its proxies in terror um, pretty much from, their, from the Islamic resolution, uh, Revolution, uh, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Houthis, um, et cetera. Now, there was peace. There was a form of peace. There was a form of ceasefire on October 6th. But then Hamas attacked us, raping, killing, burning whole families alive. Well, who was pulling the strings, if not the tyrants of Tehran? So it's not as if they, they want to paint this picture as if they started, you know, we did something mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, they're doing something now. That's not the case. This started long ago, and Iran is pulling all the strings in the Middle East, as far as terror is concerned. Mr. Hyman, good morning. Um, President Biden, in his phone call with Prime Minister Netanyahu over the weekend, certainly expressed U.S. support for Israel's need to defend itself, but also told the prime minister to, quote, take the win. And U.S. officials mm -hmm. urging Israeli, is their Israeli counterparts to not do something they'd regret, another quote, uh, in terms of retaliation. Could you give us a sense, how much is your government going to listen to the Council of the United States and not uh, do a significant escalation here? I can't stress um, the nature of the relationship, of, of, of the friendship, of the uh, shared values that we have with the American people and with the administration. And we thank the administration for everything that they've done for us and continue to do for us. Um, but at the same time, we will have to, as a sovereign state, make the decisions to uh, defend our country in the best possible way. Now, in the beginning of the war, we were told, don't rush into Gaza, you know, don't go in hot-headed, and we didn't. We waited it out. We went in cool, calm, and collected. And we will, we're will. we currently assessing the situation with Iran, um, and we will act accordingly. But at the end of the day, it's us that grabbed our toddlers. It's us that grabbed our, our babies and ran for cover uh, on Saturday night when uh, 300 missile suicide drones um, were, were, were being blown up over the skies above us. So Israeli uh, government spokesperson Avi Hyman, thank you very much for coming on this morning. We appreciate it. Joining us now, White House National Security Communications Advisor and Assistant to the President, retired Rear Admiral John Kirby. Thank you so much for coming on this morning. So much happened over the weekend. I'm curious um, if you can assess for us what the options are on the table for Israel and and I know that you've already said that it, it, it's up to Israel to make a decision as to what their response will be. How much influence, though, will the United States have on that being a, as much diplomacy as possible, uh, given 
given how much upheaval the region is already enduring? Well, as you know, uh, Mika, the president convened the G7 leaders yesterday to talk about a uni unified, strong diplomatic response. And those leaders talked about uh, other ways uh, we can work together to try to hold uh, Iran accountable. So we're exploring uh, some of those options uh, as we speak. Uh, we'll see where that discussion goes. Uh, but what Iran did was truly unprecedented. Um, and the world needs to speak with one voice that that's unacceptable and, and that they should be held to account uh, for a, a scale of attack that we just haven't seen before coming from Iranian soil. Now, again, as you said, what the uh, Israelis uh, will do, they will do and they will talk about about that, and I certainly want to reserve them that space. The president was clear with Prime Minister Netanyahu on Saturday night uh, that this was an extraordinary military success. It showed yeah. not only is Israel's military superiority, but that Israel's not alone. That the United States actually, he actually put, the president put American fighter jets in the air actively defending uh, Israel uh, in harm's way. Uh, that goes a long way, and that sends a strong message about where Israel is in the region versus where Iran is in the region, which is increasingly yeah. isolated. Incredible precision and uh, prevention uh, led by the U.S. to intercept this attack. Um, and I, I wonder what what that collective, quick, fast, precise action says to Iran and about Iran. I think it says to Iran that when the president says we are committed to the self-defense of Israel, he means it. Uh, this wasn't mm -hmm. just about giving Israel weapons. We actually had American fighter pilots in the air. We had American ships at sea knocking things down. Uh, we were very much actively engaged. And, and the thing I think it says about Iran is uh, that they don't have that military superiority. I mean, what they tried to do, they utterly failed. Uh, and again, I want to mm -hmm. go back to what I said before. It also shows that Israel is not alone. They do have friends. We aren't. Nobody's walking away from them and their ability to defend themselves. But again, the president also has made it clear he doesn't want to see a war with Iran. We don't want to see this conflict widen and deepen and broaden throughout the region. Uh, we want to see things de-escalate. Can I um, switch the conversation a little bit back to Gaza and Rafa and your relationship with the Israelis on that front? Because when we're talking about friends, um, after the shooting of the uh, World Central Kitchen uh, aid workers, America basically said to Israel, if you don't allow more aid in, we will reconsider our policies towards Israel. Are you satisfied with the amount of it? The aid has stepped up. Do you think it's enough? Are you satisfied? Is that threat of reconsidering um, your policy towards Israel now off the table? Thanks, Caddy. Yeah, the aid has incre uh, increased and quite dramatically in, in just the last few days, more than 2,000 trucks have been able to get in. I think I'm, I might be uh, wrong on this number, but I think it's nearly 100 or so over the last 24 hours alone. Uh, so the aid is getting in. Uh, that's important, but it has to be sustained. Uh, and what we also said was uh, our policy with respect to Gaza uh, will have to change if we don't see changes over time and have them sustained. So, so far, yes, uh, they have been meeting the commitments they made to President Biden. They have been doing the things that the president asked them to to do, uh, but we really need to see it sustained over time. Jonathan Lemire, <clears throat> can we get audio? Can, all right, I'm going to take Jonathan Lemire's audio. For, <laughs> I guess that microphone doesn't work. Um, Admiral, just moving forward, what will the White House be looking for and working toward in the next few days, given the dramatic attack that was intercepted over the weekend? It appears all is calm in Israel, given that schools are opening. But Israel has said yeah. they will respond when they feel like it, when they feel they are ready, and that there will be a response. What's the message that the administration is sending to Israel as they consider what to do next? I think really it, 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 that uh, came out of the discussion with the president and the prime minister on Saturday night. Again, it was uh, commending a, a, an incredible military achievement, which, again, showed uh, that Israel has friends and showed that Israel is military, militarily superior to Iran. Uh, Iran did not show itself well uh, on Saturday night, mm -hmm. given what they tried to do and versus what got in. Uh, and I think the president's message to President, uh, I'm sorry, to Prime Minister Netanyahu was, this is an extraordinary military success. This is a huge diplomatic success. It's quite an achievement. You ought to think about 
what that success sends as a message to Iran and to the region and consider, uh, you know, how, how important the impact of what you proved you could do on Saturday night really is. Uh, the president doesn't want to see this thing widen, doesn't want to see a war with Iran. And again, that's been a consistent message from him. Yep. White House National Security Communications Advisor and advise Assistant to the President, retired Rear Admiral John Kirby. Thank you very much. A lot going on on this Monday morning. So Republican, and this is to the politics of this, which is fascinating, Republican New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu, he spent the better part of the past year criticizing Donald Trump very severely. He got deep on everything from his legal issues to his cognitive abilities. Take a look. He doesn't have the fastball. He doesn't have the energy. He's, I mean, I think at one of the, his last rallies, he's talking about Jesus Christ as Speaker of the House and comparing himself to Nelson Mandela. If he's not on the teleprompter, he goes, it's not the same guy. This is the guy, this is the guy that was blaming Nikki Haley for January 6th and couldn't, if he's off the teleprompter, this is not Donald Trump of 2016, guys. So, if he is off the teleprompter, he can barely keep a, co a cogent thought. I mean, that's just fact. But you've seen him in person as many, probably more times. I've worked with him very closely. He's not the same guy. This is not Donald Trump. He on, didn't on have a fastball. prompter last night. Yeah. Look, this guy is nearly 80 years old. Thank you he's for your 77. service. He's 77. Yeah, that's nearly 80. Well, do math later, but look, he's, he, he's, you he's, are so this sorry. is not, this is not 2016 anymore. He's not on his fastball. Okay. And now everything is completely different. Uh, Sununu was pressed yesterday by ABC's George Stephanopoulos on a major flip-flop by Sununu himself. Take a look of this, uh, lengthy exchange. It's brutal. Please explain, given the fact that you believe he contributed to an insurrection, how you can say we should have him back in the Oval Office. It's not because for me, it's not about him as much as it is the, uh, having a Republican administration, Republican secretaries, Republican rules, a sense where states' rights comes first, individual rights comes first, parents' rights comes first. We're going to have a pro-business economy. We're not going to have a cancel culture that has really infiltrated all across America. It's not about Trump with me. It's about bringing those more. But he will be your president. Right? I'm the governor you of the say... Free or Die State, bringing that mentality back. That doesn't make any sense to me, Governor. I'm sorry. You're saying it's not about Trump. You're saying he would be the president. And you've said he's an insur someone who's contributed yep. to an insurrection. I understand it doesn't make sense to you, George, but look at the polls. What you're telling me is you don't understand why 51 percent of this country is supporting Donald Trump. They're not crazy. They're not mega uh, conservatives. They're not extremists. They want culture change. So Governor, I I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not, I'm not from, talking. The bigger I'm not, issue is... <laughs> I'm not talking about polls. I'm asking you a very simple question. You believe Donald Trump contributed to an insurrection. That's correct, right? I stand by the statement. You stand yeah. by the statement that he contributed look, to words, an insurrection. He, his, look, and you, be, look, you believe words, that someone, you he, believe that a president who contributed to an insurrection should be president again? Uh, as does 51 percent of America, George. So, so just to sum up, you would you would support him for president even if he's convicted in classified documents. You support him for president even though you believe he contributed to an insurrection. You support him for president even though you believe he's lying about the last election. You'd support him for president even if he's convicted in the Manhattan case. I just want to say the answer to that is yes, correct? Yeah, me and 51 percent of America. Okay, Ed Luce, uh, I'm not going to ask you what happened to Sununu. That, that's for Sununu to deal with uh, himself. But that answer, um, what does that tell you about where our part politics are today? Oh, nothing, nothing cheerful, uh, nothing, nothing no. inspiring. I mean, this is uh, very clearly a person saying that my party and my own career survival matters more than my country because it's quite clear what his views were originally, which were the correct views, that this is a threat, Trump poses a threat to the Republic, to the Constitution, to regular democratic order, um, and that he'll still, with this bizarre repetition of because 51 percent of Americans agree with me, that means doing the wrong thing uh, is justifiable. That's about the only line of defense he had. And I think it's relevant. It wouldn't be relevant if it was just Chris Sununu. But it's relevant because, uh, you know, we've yet to see what deal Nikki Haley will do um, mm -hmm. if, if, she, if indeed she's going to do one to support Trump and what she will get in 
return for that, if indeed that happens. We see Marco Rubio auditioning overtly to be his running mate. We know what Marco Rubio has said about Trump. We know what Lindsey Graham said about Trump. I mean, you can go through like nine pins. Um, most of the Republican Party... Um, and point out that they had just as scathing views that this man was not fit to be president and then did a complete pivot um, and decided for self-preservation instinct or career advancement that they would back a man unfit to be president. So what does it say about politics in the GOP today? It says they do not care about their country. U.S. national editor at the Financial Times, Ed Luce. Thank you very much for being on this morning. This is a live look outside the courthouse where history will be made today in Manhattan as the first criminal trial of a former American president will get underway in that courthouse in just about just under two hours. Um, our next guests are going to be talking about what starts today, and that's jury selection. Um, and one of the things is uh, the effort to find Hold out jurors. We'll talk about what that means. Uh, let's bring in former U.S. attorneys and MSNBC contributors Chuck Rosenberg and Barbara McQuaid. Barbara, let's back up a little bit. A lot of people will really start to tune into this for a number of reasons. Um, there's been a lot of delays and a lot of waiting for this trial to begin, a lot of debate over whether this is the more serious or less serious trial, whether that even matters. Um, and what is on the line here? Um, I would like to know exactly if you could explain what this trial is about. I know it's centered around a hush money payment, but what will the prosecution be trying to prove here? So, Mika, the indictment alleges that Donald Trump falsified business records, which is a crime in itself under New York law, but it's a misdemeanor. It becomes a felony, however, if those falsifications are done to conceal some other crime. And the other crime that is alleged here is campaign finance laws. So it is the theory of Alvin Bragg that these records were falsified on the eve of the 2016 election, also at the same time that the Access Hollywood tape had been revealed to the public, in which Donald Trump, of course, spoke very disparagingly of women, and that the need to, to conceal these records was to promote his campaign and prevent the disclosure of these very damaging allegations that otherwise would have come out without the payments to Stormy Daniels. They were instead uh, uh, booked as if they were legal fees to Michael Cohen, when in fact it was reimbursement to Michael Cohen, who had paid this hush money. So, Chuck, uh, Donald Trump has taken to Truth Social this morning, post after post after post, um, complaining about what's about to happen in a couple of hours. Give us a little bit, of, if you will, as to how you think jury selection will play out. But but just also go big picture about, about why why this really matters. It feels like we've been living with this idea for so long that Donald Trump's going to be charged with this. And he, we've seen him in court a bunch. But today's different. It's the beginning of a criminal trial. And a former president of the United States is a defendant. That's right. So it is different, to your point, Jonathan. Uh, Jury selection should not be a mystery, and it should not be complex, and it shouldn't take all that long. And maybe I'm biased because where I practiced as a prosecutor, it was fast and efficient, and you inevitably seated a fair jury. And I think they'll get there, too, in this case. It may take a bit longer. Procedures in state court in New York are different than procedures in uh, federal court in Virginia, where I was. Uh, but the goal here, Jonathan, is to get a fair jury. And you can be fair if you're a Democrat or a Republican. You can be fair if you watch Fox or MSNBC. People are remarkably good at putting aside whatever opinions they may have, whatever preferences they may have, and as the judge will instruct them, focusing on the facts adduced to trial and applying the law as the judge instructs. Uh, so I think a lot of this is a, a, it's a bit of theater. It's a bit of a dance. Mm -hmm. The faster we get through this process uh, and to trial and to adducing the evidence and calling witnesses and introducing documents, I think the better off uh, we'll all be. And, Chuck, some of the details that along the way here, obviously Donald Trump is under a gag order. There's probably running bets on whether or not he breaks that or already has. Mm -hmm. um, the concern, of course, is when he does that, he endangers the lives of people uh, and drums up anger, um, uses it to his political mm -hmm. advantage. But really, it's for the safety of the people involved with this trial. Um, 
what are the consequences if he does that? I mean, we haven't really seen consequences play out on the breaking of gag orders along the way mm. with Donald Trump. Uh, will this be different? It may well be, Mika. Look, you know, it's an incredibly crass thing to do. To your point, it's also mm. an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And it also, if you just take a step back, makes absolutely no sense. It's like if you're a pitcher and you're walking out to the mound in the top of the first inning and you stop by home plate to tell the umpire that he's stupid and corrupt and, and, <laughs> and incompetent, I'm not sure you're going to get a lot of close calls over the balance of the game. Mm -hmm. So as a strategy, it makes absolutely no sense to me. And by the way, if he's convicted, this very judge who he has been castigating and the judge's family who he has been criticizing publicly this is the guy who's going to sentence him uh, and so to me you know crass and dangerous and ineffective but maybe that's the game plan uh, Mika for reasons you and I just can't fathom joining us now from outside the courthouse in lower Manhattan NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard Vaughn how long could this jury selection take what are the boundaries to the timeline if any and what will you be looking for today we're looking at potentially weeks here for this jury selection process. We know that 6,000 New Yorkers are being summoned here to the Manhattan criminal courts this week alone, an uptick from any normal week because of the stakes of the Trump trial. What is unique about this jury selection process, though, is anybody who comes in is able to dismiss themselves for no exact reason. Of course, the prosecution and the defense will also have the opportunity to ask potential jurors questions. They're going to be looking for 12 individuals plus those six alternates to sit inside of that jury box. And just in the last 60 seconds, Mika, while we were playing Laura's story, uh, Donald Trump has uh, uh, officially arrived here to the mm -hmm. lower Manhattan courthouse for the beginning of this trial. You know, this is something that goes back now to 2016, when two weeks before the election, Michael Cohen arranged that payment to Stormy Daniels to silence her story. Over the course of 2017, 11 checks were sent to Michael Cohen, reimbursing him, including nine of them personal checks from Donald Trump, which hit at the heart of this very trial in those 34 felony counts. Now, Donald Trump's story over the course of the last eight years has never been clear. In February of 2018, right after the first public story came out uh, detailing this Cohen and Stormy Daniels arrangement, Donald Trump said he didn't know anything about it. Ask Michael Cohen, he said. But then you fast forward, there were suggestions that Donald Trump was aware that he was writing personal checks to Michael Cohen, even though it stated it was as a legal retainer. But then just a year ago, days before his indictment, I was on Donald Trump's plane the last time I was on his plane. And I asked him three separate questions about the extent to which he knew that Michael Cohen had paid off Stormy Daniels for her silence. I also asked him, what was he paying Michael Cohen for then? And every time Donald Trump gave an obfuscated, unclear answer, which hits at the heart of the question that if Donald Trump does go and testify himself, the prosecutors will have the opportunity to cross-examine him. And that is the decision that Donald Trump will make here at a time of which a trial that could last up to six weeks could lead to potentially a felony conviction and a Republican nominee heading to the convention this summer in Milwaukee who has those felony convictions next to his name, Mika. You know, Vaughn, it's just so interesting. Uh, as you just reported, Donald Trump is in the courthouse right now. I mean, history has begun uh, as the first former president to be enduring, to be facing a criminal trial under a gag order. Um, you know, the way this is described, this trial is this hush money case about hush money that was paid to Stormy Daniel. And from knowing Donald Trump from before he ran for president, when he was uh, doing The Apprentice and running his businesses, so to speak, at Trump Tower, um, there are two people who will be testifying in this trial who were the closest to Donald Trump in his life, the closest to him in his business, the closest to him during his campaign, and even the closest to him during part of his presidency. And those two people are, the last part has to do with Hope Hicks and also Michael Cohen. Um, and they will be testifying in this trial. And I personally know that's especially triggering to Donald Trump, especially testimony from Hope Hicks. When you look at these other people who will potentially be witnesses in this trial, the other real trigger factors for this former president, and I say trigger factors because when he gets triggered, he starts posting in all caps crazy things, untrue things 
on Truth Social or in front of the microphone. He says it himself. But you say David Pecker there, that's also a former friend uh, who he wanted to kill stories uh, or about himself that might have been embarrassed before the election, embarrassing to Donald Trump. And then you also saw Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. These are embarrassments for him, especially in front of his wife, Melania. Um, there's been a lot of reporting about how the women who hold Donald Trump accountable uh, tend to trigger him the most, make him the most upset, unhinged. And it's going to be interesting to see how Donald Trump plays this politically. He calls this election interference because, of course, he's a candidate for president and this is interfering in his election. Um, at the same time, uh, the narratives that are going to come out of this trial, it'll be interesting to see how the public responds to this. I think this trial will get more attention than some of the other trials. The details are salacious. The information is easy to understand. And it's just unclear to me whether that will help or hurt Donald Trump because it will definitely put on full display his personal behavior. Um, and I wonder, Vaughn, especially with a lot of the election uh, and races that you've been covering and the way our politics have gone, I think we can expect Donald Trump to make this quite a campaign event for himself. Absolutely. And in fact, he was in central Pennsylvania here this weekend, Mika, at a campaign rally that I attended. And of course, you have those throngs of supporters that will remain loyal to him, completely dismiss any basis of any of the investigations or indictments against him. But there is a reality that the rest of the American electorate is looking at. And that is that in the last year, Donald Trump has been found liable to have sexually abused a woman, to have defamed that woman. He was found to have repeatedly engaged in financial fraud through his mm -hmm. family corporation. And now they are going to be looking at him any moment now, walking through those doors, Donald Trump walking through those doors for a criminal trial, the first for a president of the United States, a former president of the United States ever here. And this is where just this weekend, a New York, New, New York Times Siena College poll found that a majority of Americans, including independents, took the charges against him here, here in New York seriously or somewhat seriously. And Donald Trump, the issue here with this gag order is, is as we have seen over the last eight years, is on the political side of this, is that the way that he undercuts the legitimacy of his critics and his opponents is by trying to undermine their reputations through his social media account on those very campaign stages. But now Donald Trump has a gag order against him here. And we could very well expect those initial conversations inside of that courtroom to go around mm -hmm. that gag order. Because this weekend, right before he took that stage in central Pennsylvania, he put out a truth social post in which he referenced Michael Cohen saying, quote, has disgraced attorney and felon Michael Cohen been prosecuted for lying? And just days ago, he didn't name Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels by name, but he referred to them as, quote, two sleazebags who have, with their lies and misrepresentations, cost our country dearly. Now, to be clear here in the gag order, it's about, quote, making public statements about known or reasonably foreseeable witnesses concerning their potential participation in the investigation or this criminal proceeding. So it is not clear. It'd be up to the judge on whether Donald Trump actually violated this gag order. But that is where, Mika, we have two juries. The one that yeah. is going to be those 12 jurors and six alternates inside the court room, but then there is the jury of the American electorate, and we could expect Donald Trump, regardless of what happens inside, even if he is found guilty on these felony charges, to take his case to the American public at large and try to undercut anybody, even if it means former aides like Hope Hicks or Michael Cohen, mm -hmm. in order to do that. And in fact, we're just getting our first look at images of Donald Trump inside the courtroom. There he is sitting at the defendant's table. Uh, the photographers were allowed in for a few brief moments here, but as noted by Vaughn and others, cameras are not going to be permitted to remain in the courtroom when the proceedings get underway. But of course, we will keep you posted as best we can. But there are historic images there. The first time a former president sitting at a defendant's table at the beginning of his own criminal trial. Um, Charles, one of the great questions will be, is Donald Trump going to testify in his own defense? He said in recent days that he'd be willing to. There's been some reporting that his lawyers may not be so into that idea. Um, what would you, if he were your client, recommend? And just walk us through the pros and cons of it. 
Listen, John, there's no question that putting Donald Trump on the stand as a witness would be an absolute nightmare for the defense, for his defense team, and a gift to the prosecution. We've already seen Donald Trump take the stand as a witness, as he did in the E. Jean Carroll trial, and he could not control himself. He could not control himself in terms of even the limited amount of space that he had to testify and the amount of, of, of leeway that the judge gave him. He went beyond that. And you know that in a case like this, you're talking about not only candidate Donald Trump, but also defendant Donald Trump, he is not going to be able to sit in a courtroom for a period of six weeks and not boil over. I'm very much so interested to see at what point, it's not if, but when he violates the gag order that Judge Marchand has put into place. So I don't think that his attorneys are going to risk putting him on the stand simply because he's not a witness that you can prep, he's not a witness that you can predict, and he's not a witness that you can control. And so he would be acting to his own detriment to take the stand, not to mention that ultimately he's going to be in a position where he will either perjure himself or make himself look like a fool because of the prosecution's cross-examination. And there's that. Uh, if we could bring up that picture that we got from the courtroom, this was taken just moments ago of Donald Trump in court in his criminal trial, the first time ever a former president has faced criminal charges. That's him inside the Manhattan courtroom right now. Joyce. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.